This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. Our guest has just taken over the helm of one of the most important not-for-profit theaters in the country. Here to introduce him, my co-host, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Joe Papp's Public Theater has been an important cult cultural institution in this city for 50 years, indeed in this country. The new head of the theater is Oscar Eustace. He just began the job, uh, I guess, about a year ago now, Oscar. So. Well, it, we'll say a year. I actually started full-time in May. Started full-time in May. Welcome to New York. Thanks. Welcome to the Public Theater, and welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Uh, all right, Oscar, when you um, uh, sit down with your uh, board of directors at the Public Theater, uh, what are the key challenges that uh, the theater faces right now? I think they're multitudinous, honestly, Michael. Um, the, for me, the biggest overall task is that we have a theater that I think has served an incredibly important function for 50 years, and its mission, I think, is clear. Mm -hmm. Its mission started with the idea that we were going to take the greatest writer in the history of Western literature, many people would say the greatest writer in the history of the world, and offer him back to the people for nothing in the parks, that we were going to take that highest level of our culture and make it accessible to everybody. Mm -hmm. Then in 1967, Joe added another plank to that mission. We were just talking about it earlier. He took over the old Astor Place Library, created the public theater, and decided that in addition to offering the greatest writer in the canon to the people, he was going to try to add to that canon by taking work from the people. He was going to try to create new work that reflected the tremendous complexity and diversity of our city, our country, our time, and add that work to the canon of Western literature. Mm -hmm. And that dual mission, new work rubbing up against Shakespeare, Shakespeare rubbing up against new work, the contemporary rubbing up against the classic, is, I think, the core mission of the theater and always has been. What the real challenge now is how do we build this institution over the next few years in such a way that we're laying down the track that that mission will be safe in perpetuity. Because the public has also been a theater that has tended to, you know, have its great ebbs and flows of both funding and, you know, the crises that are associated with funding. We've been very sensitive to those things, and in a way we've been sensitive to them precisely because we've been a theater that's so attached to the moment. Well, I was going to, to say, time. I mean, you know, the. Um the theater's fortunes are going to rise and fall to some extent um, with, with the city because it's an integral part of the city. Absolutely. Um, it's been no secret because it's been reported quite a bit that um, uh, the theater has had some financial difficulties. Where do you stand now uh, in terms of your endowment and fundraising plans? Uh, what fundraising plans do you have so that you can continue this mission? We are in extremely healthy shape financially. I, have to, I can say that because it predates me, so I can't even take credit for it. Mm -hmm. But uh, Mara Manis, our executive director, has done a brilliant job over the last three and a half years. We're finishing in the black now for the third consecutive season. Uh, clearly, we are a stable organization financially. Our endowment is safe and strong. It's a little over $18 million. All of that has been stabilized and secured and basically positioned us to grow again which mm -hmm. is a position we haven't been in for a while. So now the question is, not just should we grow, because of course we should grow, but what are we trying to achieve by growing? What are we trying to make happen? And I think that that's part of a discussion that I'm having with the board of directors. That, yeah, go well, ahead. One of the, well, I mean, one of the things that I think there's a sense in the theater community that, that has to happen at the public theater and that hadn't been happening in a while is that there's been sort of a lack of activity there. Absolutely. People um, uh, in the theater world will say, you know, in its heyday, the public uh, had stuff going on all the time. Absolutely. Some of it was terrible, but it had to be terrible to get the great stuff that came out of it. And there's been a kind of lack of energy there for a while. Are you, do you well, accept I, that I, criticism? Uh, and is no. this something you're trying to change? I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that there's a lack of energy. I think that yeah. we've had the kind of funding crisis that has made it difficult for us to produce up to the level that we should be producing. Not the quality of productions, but the quantity. Mm -hmm. No question. We need to produce more. The, the, the comparative advantage we have as a theater company is that we've got six spaces. We've got Joe's Pub and five theaters in that building. We also have the Delacorte up in the park, which is yes, another question. Yes, and they should all be happening. Yeah, but it, 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 it's a space built right. for a tremendous amount of activity, just as the mission demands a tremendous amount of activity. If you can actually reflect the diversity of the city, you're going to have to do a lot of shows right, to right. actually do that. You can't capture that. But that's going to take money, year. and you can't crack into the endowment to And we never will that. crack into the endowment. What we have to do is figure out 
a, a long-range plan, and by long-range, three to five years is all any theater can really plan on. Mm -hmm. But figure out a plan for how are we going to raise the money necessary to produce at the level, at the quantity and diversity of work necessary to really fulfill our mission. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say that the board is completely ready and willing to jump into this discussion. I think that, again, the staff is in terrific shape. I think that I've inherited an institution that is perfectly primed for this discussion. Now, I get a lot of complaints from the public about the public theater mm -hmm. because the way the tickets are distributed for the free Shakespeare is so much, many of them go to corporate donors. And so people are constantly saying to me, I was at the front of the line, I waited to go in to see the Shakespeare, and I got the back row or nothing. And you look out because you see so many tickets are now handouts to rich people who are able to give you money that, that the public, the public per se, really isn't a significant percentage. Su Susan, that's, it's, I, I'm sure people complain because people always complain. That's simply not accurate. Last season, we gave 70% of our tickets to the line, as we call it. And that number has been consistent for at least 35 years, to the extent that we've got records. The record keeping is perhaps a little shoddy as one gets back into the 70s, 60s. Mm -hmm. There have always been tickets that have gone to sponsors. And who the heck else are they sp is supposed to pay for this? Yeah, it's free true. Shakespeare in the Park. We need to figure out ways to support it. I look at it this way. There are only really two ways we make money in the theater. We sell tickets or we get people to contribute money to us. We have an earned income and we have unearned income, although actually the people who try to raise that money don't think of it as unearned because they work hard to get it. Mm -hmm. And I think to a lot, you, you're watching every theater in the country now sort of in this new age of, you know, in which your Republican colleagues are so triumphant in, uh, <laughs> in the halls of government, Michael. It's a new age, and it's a, it's a very tricky age because it's an age of kind of capitalist triumphalism mm -hmm. where the idea of nonprofit is under threat and the very idea that there is value that can't be measured by the marketplace or by earned income is consistently under threat in the culture. And I think one of the things you can see some of our sister theaters who have clearly, um, I don't want to say blurred the line, but have clearly made decisions of trying to figure out how can they enter into a commercial arena and try to make money off of earned income that wasn't previously, previously accessible right. to nonprofits. Perfectly valid to do that. But I think the other route is equally important, and frankly, I think it's where the public's future lives, is really staking the claim that what we do is a public service. It's a public good, and it needs support from outside the marketplace. It needs government support. It needs corporate support. It needs private philanthropic support, because you can't imagine New York without us. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that is a good that we give just to individual ticket holders who can afford 50, 60, 70 and on up dollars a ticket. That's a good we provide to the whole city. On the subject of earned income, the public theater flourished um, and yep. to a large extent because of the success of a chorus line, Absolutely. which made it millions and millions of dollars. Is there a danger, though, when you're looking for earned income that you begin, and I must tell you, I haven't seen this happen in the public, but I see it happening at Roundabout Manhattan Theater Club. You begin to select plays with an eye towards their commercial appeal rather than picking plays that um, frankly would never get done in the commercial arena and should be done and can only be done in a nonprofit environment. Is that a dangerous thing to happen? I mean, does that happen to you without even thinking of it? I'll take this play because it might move to Broadway and that's a nice substantial income for us. What, what I will tell you, Michael, is I've never selected a play on that basis and I have no intention of ever selecting a play on that basis. It was actually uh, outspokenly part of the dialogue when I went through the selection process with the board in which really? I asked the board, what do you think about this? And the board was really clear, and it was one of the reasons that I was interested in taking this job. The board said, if we ever move anything commercial, it will be a happy byproduct of our fulfilling our mission. Our mission is not to move things commercially. I went, well, this is a theater I'm interested in running. It's the theater I think Joe Papp founded. Mm -hmm. Chorus Line, of course, is a huge potential distorting historical model because it's not a business plan. Mm -hmm. You can't make a business plan based on what happened with Chorus Line. I mean, thank God it did. It's winning the lottery, basically. Exactly. Yeah. But that was Michael Bennett's workshop that, that just blew but, up. But so yeah. that's the key point. Yeah. The key point wasn't that you set out no. to make Chorus Line. The key point was that Joe Papp said, this young choreographer has got this notion in his head about a show. He can't even describe to me what it is. All he can describe to me is he wants to get in the room with a bunch of chorus and start talking. And you know what? I'm going to invest in that because I believe that there's a vision there. 
And investing that vision produced an unexpected and wonderful result. But the mission was investing in the vision of the artist. The mission wasn't the result. Mm -hmm. And we have to build, we who run the institution, have to build a business plan that makes sure that we can continue to choose the mission rather than to try to... Pick the hit. Pick the hit. Yeah. Because, the, the, let me put it in a very negative way. New York does not need the public theater to be in the pick a hit business. No, um, not only picking a hit, but also there seems to be this drive on the part of a lot of nonprofit theaters in this in this town now to to win Tony awards, to be in the Tony race. I mean, is that uh, something that the public theater is going to try to keep out of for a while? Because when George Wolfe, your predecessor, was running it, he did a lot of shows on Broadway that the public produced, and that was part of the whole Tony Award Broadway circle. Are you? Well, consciously decided to keep away from Broadway for a while? Two things, Michael. We obviously can't compete for Tony Awards if we don't have shows on Broadway. Yeah. And as I've said, we're not trying to move shows to Broadway. Yeah. If shows move to Broadway, great. And we hope we win every award there is. But that is not part of our intention. The second thing I have to say is that George, his vision as an artist was what took him to Broadway. And that really was who George was and is. He's an extraordinary artist, and I think an extraordinary mix of nonprofit and commercial instincts. But those commercial instincts aren't about selling out. Those commercial instincts were about a passion to take his work to the table in the biggest table there was in the American theater. And but he was taking risks with, uh, you know, a, a, a public theater, and those risks didn't pay off, and threw the theater well, into some disarray of for a while. Some of them paid off brilliantly. Brilliant. On the town did and not. Made, Wild uh, Park uh, did not. Li listen, and I could give you the list of the shows that I've done, but I'm not going to supply that to you. You're going to have to look it up that didn't pay off. Of course, you know, the failures are the manure in which our successes grow, right. as Harold Clerman used to say. And of course, they're going to be failures. So the only point that I want to make is that George was not moving things commercially out of venal motivations. He was driven to do that. Right now, because of who I am, mm -hmm. because of what I think the theater as a whole assesses what its mission is, I think the commercial transfer is less important to us right now than actually making sure that we're creating the infrastructure to fulfill the fundamental public service mission of the theater. George, brilliant, controversial, though. Well, one of the cracks uh, knocks against him, though, was that he was... Uh, spending too much time as a director of his own productions. Do you want to be a director while you're at the public theater? Are you going to be step, you know, taking time out sometimes from the position of the artistic director to concentrate on the own particular production that Oscar Eustace is going to direct? I'm directing a show right now, so ah. I can't say I won't. <laughs> but he, here's a good example. The show I'm directing right now, it's by a young writer named Rena Groff. It's called The Ruby Sunrise. And to me, it's a perfect emblem of what the public does. Ren is a downtown writer. She's a member of Elevator Repair Service, uh -huh. a wonderful experimental theater company, who has been writing plays for a while. And she is starting to move towards writing a kind of play that is accessible to a broader audience than her previous work. And very quickly, uh, a lot of talk about David Hare's wonderful play about yeah. Iraq, Stuff Happens, yeah. which is brilliant at the National Theater and Absolutely. I've been a big advocate of, and I just can't imagine uh, why it hasn't been produced here yet since this is our war. This play, which is about our war, should be done here. You're trying to put it together. Where does that stand? What we're trying to do right now is put together a fantastic reading of it in order to stimulate the interest that we'll need in order to put together a full production of it. It's an extraordinary play, Michael. And I'm amazed. I, I don't see how you square your love of that play with your politics, but I suppose that's another discussion. Oh, well, because David, because David Hare <laughs> presents the entire array of viewpoints about the war. And just if, if, if you're a sort of a, uh, you know, a smug liberal who hates the war and hates Bush, you can watch the play for a bit and suddenly you, know, you feel oh, exactly how I see the world. And then he brings on a character who gives you a completely a new perspective on things. And you can feel the audience that's opposed to the war uh, suddenly stop and say, I've never considered it from that point of view before. I can't wait to have this fight with you, but it's a brilliant <laughs> play and I hope we can get it so, on. We'll, we'll have but, it's a question, we'll but, have but it's a budgetary issue too because sure. it's a very Huge. expensive, it's a $1.5 million play probably. But that, absolutely, but that's precisely what's, you know, again, the kind of challenge put in front of us. The reason I'd like to present it, even if it's in some limited format, is that what David is doing is precisely what the American theater needs to be doing. And we need to be, we as institutions have to figure out how we can say to our greatest American writers, write a 30 character show about what's happening to us right now and we'll put it on. But you're going to get, need the money to do that. Absolutely. But that's why institutions <laughs> Give away those have tickets have in the park. All right, we've got to stop. <laughs> right. Well, listen, we wish, we wish you luck with your uh, vision for the public theater and raising the money so that we can have these big, important plays dealing with the issues of our time produced somewhere here in the city. Thank you. Oscar Eustace, the new um, director, uh, artistic director of the Public Theater. Thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Please come back. Real pleasure. I, uh, I, I write cookbooks. Oh, cookbooks. I, I appear on 
television from time to time. <laughs> Doing what? Cooking? Cooking, you know, home entertaining. We, I, uh, I've been on the Food Network a few. Yeah, I've seen it. Have you? I'm old. Sometimes I can't reach the remote. <laughs> Joe Clayburgh is a really fine actress, one of my favorites, really. And you can see her all over town these days. <laughs> <laughs> She's more ubiquitous than Andrew Lloyd Webber, I think, on Broadway right now. Uh, you are currently starring in Naked on the Appian Way at the Roundabout Theater Company, the American Airlines Theater. Yes. A naked just, woman on a, the a Appian Way. A naked girl, just uh, to get it exactly <laughs> right. 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 A, a naked girl. It was not, not you. me. <laughs> All right. A naked girl on the Appian Way at the roundabout before you begin rehearsals for the revival of Neil Simon's Barefoot in the Park at yes. the Court Theater. Yes, yes, yes. Jill Clayberg, welcome back to New York Theater and Thank welcome you. to Theater Talk. Thank you. Um, all right. Now, before um, uh, you've sort of plunged into Broadway, you did uh, The Exonerated off Broadway, I know. I did. And you were doing some uh, plays regionally, but you had not really worked uh, uh, on the main stem, so to speak, for a number of years. What has brought you back to the theater? Well, I'd say very simply, my kids are grown up. Mm -hmm. You know, I really thought it was hard to do plays and raise a family. Just the hours, you know, I mean, dinner time and homework time and theater mm -hmm. didn't quite work for me. So <laughs> I did other things. And um, but I really love doing theater. I really, really. Did you always it. miss it though? While you were away from it, while you were raising children. I'm not the children. a missing kind of person. No. You know, I'm sort of like what I'm doing is just okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I I wasn't sitting pining for for being in in uh, plays. But uh, now, you know, you'd have a lot of trouble getting me to stop doing stop. it. <laughs> now you're also married to an eminent playwright. I am married to David Ray. Is it hard to to be married to a writer like that and then go, oh darling, I'm off to the theater? No, 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 no. He's no, no. He's, he's low he, maintenance that way. He, yeah, he, <laughs> he can cook his own turkey dogs at night or whatever. Uh, no, he. he uh, he, he he had nothing to do with it. It was really right. the children. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I really was raising three children. Uh, my nine-year-old stepson came and lived with us when he was, you know, he was nine. nine. Yeah, and he's not nine anymore. And um, then I had two of my own, and I just really liked being home. And I did a lot of TV movies and stuff, other stuff. But I just the huge commitment that a play takes, not just in terms of time, but imaginatively, mm -hmm. and just. You know, you really have to, that has to be your prime thing. You don't go, oh, well, oh, well, then I'm doing a play. It's not like that. It's just, it's totally Yeah, you focused. have to sort of pitch the whole day to doing that three hours, yes, don't you? Yes, you do. Yes, you did do. Did you find sort of now getting back into the rhythm of it, having done uh, all those movies um, and the TV shows, which maybe the TV stuff is not as difficult as doing a play, do you find, though, you've got to sort of flex the muscles again and it takes a little while to, to, to get back into it? There are different muscles. I mm. mean, the what one obvious one is a vocal one. Mm. Um, it, you know, I feel like in the last few years, I guess the play that I did first about five years ago, I was like, oh my God, I don't know, I haven't done theater, but I just felt very comfortable. I, I, I really like being on stage. Mm. So, yes, I'd say there are different muscles, and you relearn different things, and but each play is also a world in and of itself too and you're learning different things each play you do you know that there, so I mean this is a very it, this is a farce really yeah naked um, naked girl on the yeah. Appian way in this play you play a um, comfortable successful uh, cookbook author and television personality uh, whose life sort of gets uh, upended by some uh, disclosures which I guess we probably uh, should shouldn't give away uh, how do you describe the character and how do you think about this play and where this woman is at this point in her life well I think it's one of the things that I loved about the character uh, is her sort of I call it her cosmic optimism uh, she has a very you know she she really is a caretaker and a, a, a sort of an enthusiast about the possibilities of life and you really feel that nothing will stop this woman and nothing ultimately does but it she, almost does but it almost <laughs> does she definitely gets thrown off her track mm -hmm. by what mm -hmm. happens with her family and is sort of this idea that this liberal family will accept anything and any, everything will be okay and you know they're just kind of you know the hip is cool as people and that's not true. 
and the play really explores the, the, the boundaries of your own uh, prejudice and what you find acceptable in terms of love and relationships. But it does it in a very comic way. Being married to a prominent playwright, uh, does he go to see uh, this uh, play in previews and uh, does he offer his own um, criticisms or suggestions or problems with the play to his, uh, his wife late at night? <laughs> Yes, and he knows Doug. <laughs> and he always has a few notes, and they're always very, very intelligent. And usually, they're, uh, you know. And what's the protocol for uh, uh, one famous playwright giving notes on another famous playwright's play? <laughs> Gives well, it through, through his wife. She just goes and says, <laughs> no, no, Rich, no. my husband, David Ray, yeah. last night, thought that <laughs> yeah. scene in the second part of the play right. just wasn't working. Well, he did have a few. You know, it's wonderful to have someone who has such a great sense of theater come and look at something mm -hmm. and give sensible helpful notes you know Doug Hughes has the, the theory that he listens to everyone and does what he wants which I think is a very good theory for a creative person not mm -hmm. not to be closed-minded but also you have to be very you know because everybody's gonna tell you something different um, so David weighed in in his usual way, sort of <laughs> gent gently but firmly and with a couple of good ideas, as I'm sure did many people. Mm -hmm. um, Your husband is a, is a little bit press shy, though, because I've tried to interview him many times you? before. Yes, and he, he doesn't <laughs> give interviews, so you're the family spokesman. Yeah, you that's you right. No. Why is that? Why does he feel well, that he he's doesn't? he's just shy. Really? He's, he's just not, it's not, it, it's not something that he does easily or, I mean, he will, he has, done a few interviews and he's actually very eloquent mm -hmm. but I think he's he's just shy we only have a couple minutes left but I want to mention that your daughter has now become an actress was yes. this the, it, was this something you thought Jesus is swell or or were you one of those well, Lily Ray, oh, no, fine Lily actress Ray, yeah. in um, Steel Magnolias yeah making her Broadway debut Do you think year. that's a good thing that she's become an actress and did you raise her to become an actress well those are two different questions right. and I'll go backwards, right, go backwards. <laughs> I, I did not raise her to become an actress and she was she was a, a, a ballet dancer she loved the ballet and you know no I would say that I sort of discouraged her as I would any child going into the arts I would say a healthy dose of discouragement is is not a bad thing um, but then she so strongly wanted it and has really uh, proven herself quite beautifully in in the two plays that she's done in New York and the plays that she did in Gloucester. I mean, she just got rave reviews for, for proof. I, I must ask you, uh, uh, you were famous in the 1970s for Unmarried Woman Starting Over. You became a kind of an icon of the woman who is supposed to lead um, the sort of typical, comfortable, upper middle class existence of the time, whose world is then turned upside down. She has mm. to kind of fend for herself. Did you that's realize not starting over? Uh, but the unmarried woman, I think, really oh, is that's that's one movie. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, but that was a that was a movie that really it was kind a successful of, movie. It was a very successful movie, I agree. and you sort of became that that woman of that generation. Did you realize that was happening at the time? Did you see oh, yourself no. as the standard bearer for mm -hmm. the new woman of the seventies? No, I mean I'm sure you've interviewed enough actors to know that you do a lot of work, and then one piece gets very successful, and then you're identified with it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean that's just. That's the way it was. That's the way it was. And you were, did you feel that you were cast as that role and that's how they I began did. to see you? The, the, yeah. The Jill Clayburg part. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Then did you try to move away from that in any way or? You know, I tried to take interesting parts uh, and sometimes they over, you know, they, they, they crossed over that uh, line. But no, I, I, I would rather not do that. Mm. Well, we're waiting for you to come back in a revival of Pippin. <laughs> <laughs> where, where you started your, yeah. <laughs> your illustrious Broadway career. Where he was too. All right, yeah, exactly. say goodnight, Gracie. <laughs> Joe Clayberg, it's a pleasure having you on Theater Talk. We'll see you at the roundabout at Naked Girl on Good. the Appian Way. And uh, in the spring, I believe, at the Court Theater for Barefoot in the Park. Yes, I, I think it's, it opens maybe in February. Good, good. Thank Good luck. You. Thank you.